Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dustin, Berserker Bear. Welcome to another episode of Bushwhacking History in Buffalo. Good to be back. Good to see everybody. Hope everyone's doing good. Skull to your October. Fitting, I got the Jack Skeleton shirt on with my mug. Daughter loves it. Hope everyone's doing good. Today we're going to do a reading of one of my books, Shadows of the Western Door, and uh, correlate it with the, right here, the epicenter of um, Buffalo, New York, Niagara Square. We got Buffalo City Hall there. I got boots on the ground, so it's going to be a classic boots on the ground for you, and I'm also going to do a reading. We'll roll in October with a esoteric reading from a pretty esoteric book. And it, it describes uh, radio patterns. It um, delves into a little bit of um, Joseph Ellicott and the history of Buffalo along with the history of Washington, D.C. So let's get right into it. Thank you for coming back. This is Bushwhack and History in Buffalo with Berserker Bear. Here we go. urban vista in America. So in fitting with that awesome intro, Let's get right into it. That was um, that showed you uh, glimpses of the um, city hall in Niagara Square, and I was there. Yes, we're gonna show boots on the ground. I say classic boots on the ground. That's what I'm talking about. Gonna do that. Uh, as I'm reading, we'll show the boots on the ground. That might not play all the way through. It's not a long reading. It's a couple chapters, but. Um, this is the cover. It's a signed edition by Mason Winfield. I think next uh, episode, next video I do, will uh, have my wife explain how she found this book at the place that we work at and where we met. Fifteen years ago, I've had this book under my nose. So let's do that. You know what? I'm going to remove my mug off this. You guys don't need me all the time on here, huh? You know what I look like. So yeah, I'll have my wife explain how she found this book. Very um, interesting. So signed copy too. Very cool. We're going to read the introduction. You get a pause on that if you can. Introduction goes to that. Goes to Buffalo's Mystical Layout. and the sacred lines. So it's gonna be a reading. We'll play a montage of uh, everything Buffalo. Got a whole, bu a whole bunch of, there's like 200 pictures in this. This should play through. There's little snippets of information in here, two articles. So that's gonna play. And then we'll do um, a little prelude for gravy in the future. These are all the books I have of Buffalo. I like to do, if this goes well, I like to read from these in the future. Um, Obviously, this one's going to be relevant soon. This one's, like, relevant now. Happy All Hallows' Eve. And, um, you know, here we go. Like, very cool book. This is relevant, too, here, Psychic Highway, because what we're going to read is uh, very cool, very interesting, very esoteric, a little bit um, 
brushing up to the occult, but um, we know our faith here, and I think you know mine, so I know where I'm at. And uh, I'm at Niagara Square yesterday, right here. So let's see if I still got it in me. Like I said, this is what we're reading from, Shadows of the Western Door by Mason Winfield. Very interesting, very cool book. And uh, Woody, I still didn't forget, homie. It's never, the realm ever shakes back to normal, my man. We'll get to some of these places. There's a lot of information in here. When I say Woody, I mean Wood and Nichols. Uh, we had ambitions to get together and do some of these places before. We might still get to that yet, huh, homie? So we'll see. That's what I'm reading from. If you pause it and uh, screenshot, you can read along if you're hip to that. And let's see if I still got the old classic quintessential boots on the ground skills up in her. So I was here yesterday, parked right over yonder. Started taking pics right about here on this uh, triangle right here. So let's see if I still got that. Boom. Oh, not perfect, but almost. There we go. Almost. Okay, let's start the slideshow, and I'm going to read. So I hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the channel. As always, hit the like, share, subscribe, and appreciate all your help and support, all the love. Let's get into it. Shadows of the Western Door. Introduction. For most of the 20th century, it seems Western New York has been on the short end of a pervasive geographic snobbery. The region's national image, symbolized in its nucleus, Buffalo, is probably that of a humble, rust belt domain of faint initiative, withering spirits, and migrating talent, a homely place where not too much ever seems to happen. Some of this image problem is our own fault. A city that's roots, a city that roots expressways through its Olmstead parks and between its citizenry and its waterfront cannot blame the fate cannot blame fate that its staple industry is not tourism even in a spiritual sense the region seems out of public favor as if no respectable vision quest could skirt Taos or Stone and Stonehenge and conclude here it was not always so the first white settlers of western New York marveled at its relics and earthworks Evidence of earlier cultures whose settlement may have been more constant and populous than in any other region of the Americas. They stared into the ancient woods, across the landscape changing through its four full seasons, or down the peaceful creeks, and wondered mightily about their human history. By the middle of the 19th century, this region seemed miraculous. As a source of religious zeal that led to cults, communities, most of them countercultural, and two major modern religions. Many thought some occult energy native to the area must be behind this and its many other manifestations. This book, A Paranormal Survey of Western New York, is an informal consideration of just that subject. Modern parapsychology, uh, psychical or psi, PSI research, has three general studies, almost all of which are conducted in laboratories. Number one, extrasensory perception, or ESP, in humans and animals. Psychokinesis, or PK, mind over matter, supernatural, physical abilities. Third, theta, research, life after death. Despite this apparently clear-cut chart, Physical research in the late 1900s seems to lack strong direction. Even as the AMA begins to consider alternate healing practices and computer printouts support the validity of astrology, the goals of physical research societies are curiously diffuse, and elsewhere the defenders of psi research seem on the general run. However, the supernatural industry, that is, public interest in the subject for fun and guidance, is doing very well as it usually does at the end of a century and does invariably at the end of a millennium. This book is not physical research. It is a regional survey into the fuzzy fringe. We'll use the term paranormal for most of all of it. 
that seems to flank the parameters of laboratory research, such as UFOs, mystery monsters, hauntings, earth energies, ancient anomalies, offbeat religious groups, magical societies, and even old-fashioned ghost lore. Some of this, of course, with the fuzz off, represents real venues for understanding. We ran a comb through Western New York and commented on some of what we came up with. The reader will find chapters in each of the rough categories organized themselves as we went along. We first got onto the idea of making a book like this during the research into the Roycroft, East Aurora's arts and crafts movement community, which, as we suspect, was involved with mysticism and maybe a bit more. Attempting to understand its location here, we dug onto the roots of the region around a little bit, and with each metaphoric spadeful, something else interesting came up. This, we figure, was a sign of something and a story worth telling. As we debated how to limit our survey area, we realized that probably any limit was artificial. If the paranormal disrespects Earth's physical laws, it would hardly heed human geographical boundaries. The old Genesee country, though New York State west of the line dropped south of Sodus Bay along Seneca Lake through Elmira, this was general territory of the Seneca Nation, the historic inhabitants of western New York. Their old title was the Keepers of the Western Door, the Guardians of the Western Entrance to the Landscape Longhouse, their Iroquois Confederation was envisioned. Though they took this land for many others by force of arms, it was theirs when the whites arrived, and we could not only forget them in any page of our study of their traditional territory. Buffalo's mystical layout. Our nation's capital shared designs with the palace and gardens of Versailles, a sacred geometrical layout if there ever was one. If Buffalo is like Washington in many particulars, our case is made. Washington DC, said to be very haunted, was laid out according to late 18th century mystical thought. Many of Washington's buildings and monuments, even recently built ones, embody sacred architecture a subject we discuss a little in our chapter on the Roycroft. Most obviously, the Washington Monument. Modeled with Egyptian geometry after Egyptian obelisks, streets converging on the Capitol and Lincoln Park were arranged to form solstical alignments. From the Capitol lawn on the summer solstice, the sunrise is in line with Maryland Avenue. Compass points, as in Masonic Lodges and the Great Pyramid, were also critical quotients in Washington's layout. This makes little sense to most of us now, but it was a logical thing to do near the end of the 18th century when, of course, this type of thought was not quite so offbeat. The three great architects of the young nation were steeped in the philosophy of their day, an undertaking as important as the capital city of the new perfect nation would be worth doing right from the roots up. Landscape layouts would be a part of the deal. It was said that in the design of our nation's capital, four great intellects stand out, Washington, Lafont, Jefferson, and Ellicott. By the last name is meant Andrew Ellicott brother of Buffalo's founders. The plot thickens from there. The architect who gets public credit for Washington's design is Major Pierre Lafont, a French officer and engineer who had fought well with the Revolutionary War and was wounded at Savannah. He had risen from lieutenant to major of engineers and was 36 when he worked on Washington. 
Lafont may have known as Masonic symbolism, but, quote, his obstinacy through every difficulty in the way, unquote, wrote George Washington, who canned him. Andrew Ellicott took over. Andrew Ellicott, by 1800, was a geographer general of the United States, a multifaceted man, a distinguished engineer who had already served on the state boundary commissions, an astronomer, and vice president of the American Philosophical Society, in the chair often occupied by Franklin and Jefferson. If Andrew Ellicott was his family's occult philosopher, his brother Joseph was its mathematician. On his 40th, bir- on his 40th birthday, November 1st, 1800, Joseph Ellicott became resident agent for the Holland Land Company, opening 3 million acres for settlement. His survey was based on astronomical observations and the establishment of meridians. Joseph may have assisted his brother Andrew at Washington, but it's sure they both worked on Buffalo. Their, quote, real, quote, plan for Buffalo, radiating streets was based on the work of engineers at Versailles and Philadelphia. The Ellicott's 1804 street plan doesn't look too mystical to us, but we're going on what we're told. Of course, it's much smaller setup than will be even needed 20 years later, and most of the streets have different names. They seem tributes to rich Dutch investors and brother Joseph's Batavia bosses. Even the street pointing straight to Niagara Falls is named Schimmelpenick Avenue, and not its present Niagara Street. Yet it runs right through Niagara Square, which was obviously the nucleus of the young town. We suppose every city has to have a center. We wonder what made them pick that one. Sometimes called the father of Buffalo, Joseph Ellicott took a look at the mouth of Buffalo Creek and saw an ideal lake harbor he was determined to make into a city, New Amsterdam. His mansion would have been in today's downtown by the Ellicott Square building and the old Iroquois Hotel. But the city's fathers had other ideas. Old Joseph's inveterate talent for rubbing people the wrong way seems to have risen up and bit him. And the name and the site got away from him. Ellicott grew out of touch with Buffalo as the years went by, though he still considered the city his baby. Adled in later age, Ellicott infuriated clients of the Holland Land Company and he was eventually fired. He committed suicide in 1826, some say in connection with the William Morgan affair. He was a prominent mason apparently into the matter up to his eyeballs. Precisely what he was up to with Buffalo may have to wait a bit longer, but when one looks at the mystical connections of the city's very roots, it seems no wonder that some exceptional energy might still be at work. End chapter. The Sacred Lines Your literal belief in the insights of this article may depend partly on your faith in the ley lines, energy paths across the landscape, and the power of dowsing. Fair enough, the author keeps his mind open as he advises others. In an attempt to learn what we could about Buffalo's mystical layout, we contacted an expert, Steve Nelson, a speaker and teacher well known in esoteric circles. Currently living in Charlotte, North Carolina, Steve is in astrologer, a geomancer, and a student of the sacred landscape. His wife, Darley Adair, or Adare, a consultant in the old Chinese art of landscape magic known as feng shui, wind and water, is also a map dowser. She can divine natural energy, long range. The enlightened pair set their sights on buffalo and took us in some directions we didn't expect. It's quite reasonable to suspect that Buffalo didn't just happen into the shape that it is. According to Steve's sources, Ben Franklin admired the Iroquois mystical traditions and believed in the power of sacred landscape. He inspired the new citizens of the United States to shape their towns and villages along Native American patterns, which often follow natural energy lines in the earth. When we pointed out to Steve that the central roadways of Buffalo and its regions 
routes 5, 20, and 16 were all ancient Native American trails. He merely chuckled as if he should have already guessed. There was a considerable Native American mystical le legacy in the region when Buffalo was forming. The Iroquois word orenda refers to the little force, or excuse me, the Iroquois word orenda refers to the life force involved with the sacred landscape. Buffalo was settled decades before it was christened. Yet the day of its incorporation, April 20th, 1832, makes Buffalo, astrologically speaking, the first degree tourist city. With a grand trine, sun, moon, and Saturn in Earth. This is interesting since the buffalo, the American animal for which the city is apparently named, though there is some debate about this, corresponds to the European bull symbol, Taurus. Buffalo's chart tells Steve that there are lots of resources in Buffalo, both spiritual and material. Its energies involve earth and water, the terrestrial two of the Greek four elements. This is right in keeping with Buffalo's stereotype as a blue collar town. Its citizenry will work hard and pay their taxes, but they won't set Hollywood on fire. Even today in some circles, the New Age landscape mythology features Buffalo with its northern bull and earth energies as one of the four cardinal points of the nation. The others are Washington, Atlanta, and Los Angeles. Buffalo astrologer Cassandra Joan Borel agrees with Steve that some inspiring changes may be coming for the region in the late 90s and beyond the year 2000. There will be breakthroughs in Buffalo, possibly in research and medicine. Many of the Erie County citizens should undergo a great awakening. Buffalo will become more and more a place of pilgrimage for those seeking to ground their spiritual visions through its terrestrial forces. We don't have to wait for the next millennium to confirm that. Buffalo is a good place to get grounded now. Whatever energy there is here tolerates only so much human pretension, only so long. Niagara Square caught the eye of the spiritual couple who felt sure this was the heart center of the city. Through map dowsing, Darley identified three major lays or lines of force at the core of the city, all radiating to or from Niagara Square. The big one comes down Niagara Street, pointing right to that power, Niagara Fa that power point, Niagara Falls, one thing Stephen Darley couldn't have known from the maps that we sent them. Another originates at Gate Circle, once an impressive natural fountain, and wends down Delaware Avenue. The third is Genesee Street, which, as Buffalo geomancer Franklin Lavoie observe, observes, heads right to an earth mound. Is it an ancient man-made one? Steve notes that these lays are the spiritual lifelines of the city, beacons of power that lure all kinds of tappers, natural and supernatural. He points out most of the haunted sites in his native Charlotte are along lays. Steve's feeling is that somebody, possibly Joseph Ellicott, Dows the location of Niagara Square. Though the square is not precisely an octagon, the streets that once shot from it in eight directions evoke that symbol to the same effect. Furthermore, the classic feng shui pattern known as the Bagua fits quite neatly over the shape of the square. Its location and composition, its obelisk, fountain, and sitting make it, geomantically speaking, a rare accumulator of telluric power. The square brings energies in from all lays. It's a resonator for the entire region. When they're at the center of a convergence of streets, reports Steves, obelisks are like tuning forks. Vibes go in all directions. Though New York is a Leo state, Steve senses that Buffalo is an earthy spot of it in need of energizing influence, like fire. He suggests that a big garnet, the state stone, a fire symbol, placed at Niagara Square, would start giving the region a better balance of Leo energy. A perpetual flame might help there too, where an ounce of prevention would be pounds of cure. 
It's perhaps in keeping with Steve's recipe for buffalo that lions, symbols of primal fire, were placed here about the McKinley Monument. Even they seem to need a zap, though they're lounging Leos. We may have gotten a look at these forces in the 1970s when the Mid-City Beautification Project of Mayor Stanley Mikowski administration brought the public to a curious outrage. Improvements to the Niagara Square turned into a brickwork of a bagel. Only muggers and revolutionaries would have appreciated. Behind this terracotta crenels, the square's graceful lions barely peeped. Its classical fountain cowered, and its pale obelisk shot staringly skyward, like a missile ready to launch above sandbags. It perhaps affirms the spiritual significance of the site that simply obstructing its view touched such a nerve in the circling motorists one would have thought too busy to notice. Long into the rising rhetoric, the mayor backed his planners with several hundred thousand taxpayer dollars. Fort Mikowski was eventually dispersed, and in many minds the phrase came to stand for a good man's embattled term as mayor. End chapter. Okay, so that was a reading from Shadows of the Western Door. Hope you liked it. And as um, always, I hope that you learn something when you come to my, my channel. Now, I got a prelude for uh, in the future. I told you about that. Going to do probably a reading from, well, this one. Maybe I can find something on Niagara Square in this, and if that's the case, I'll tail it up. Um, I'll dovetail it off of this one with my next video. I'm also going to do more of an in-depth on Ellicott, Joseph Ellicott. I don't even have him on here. Oh, that. Holland. The Holland Land Company and the establishment of Buffalo itself. Because I have some ideas as to what was found here and if uh, Joseph Ellicott himself actually uh, physically laid the, the radial pattern out. But I digress. That will be for another future video. Uh, going forward, uh, please come check my channel out, Bushwhack and History in Buffalo. I have links to my IG, which is BerserkerBear1111, if it loads up ever. All research-related I mirror a lot of the work that I do on YouTube here. So check that out, please. Also, this links to my Odyssey. I do have a backup Odyssey. Every video that I load up to my YouTube will go here. So just in case. Uh, pretty cool. I, I really like it, actually. And um, one thing before we wrap up. Come check out my channel for my cousins. They fish the, the waterways in and around Buffalo, and that's all they do is catch fish. And they do a great job. So if you like fishing and you like my channel, go check them out. They definitely crush. So with that, I mentioned something about breaking radial patterns. And if you were, were paying attention to the reading, which I hope you were, and it, it said the importance of them, and one of the important ones was the Genesee Street because it led to a mound. Now let's pull that up right quick. So at the end, at the tail end of the reading, they were talking about these uh, streets, about the energy here in Buffalo, which I think is so cool. Again, I had this book under my nose for 15 years, and lo and behold, it has the answers to a lot of the stuff that I'm researching right, right within it. So... Here's Niagara Square, there's Niagara Street, there's Delaware, there's Genesee. Let's go correlate that here on the map. And the breaking of a radial. I'm not sure what it means, but I'll, I'll do some more research for you. I'll get boots on the ground, maybe I'll do that for my next video. 
Okay, so going up here, this is Niagara Street, so that would be facing Niagara Falls. Middle is Delaware, no obstruction. And here's Genesee Street, and then there is a break. Modern building in the radial. So that's what I would say, break in the radial. And uh, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And uh, we're in modern times. Not that we're any different from biblical times, because I still think that we are in them. So others beware. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I mean about breaking a radial. And um, intentional or city planning or who knows, I believe that is the... Uh, Convention Center, actually, yeah. I used to watch monster truck um, shows there. So, the breaking of a radio. Uh, got boots on the ground there yesterday. I showed you the pictures, did a little bit of a research into Niagara Square, showed you the new intro for my, my channel, Mr. Brees. My man, I appreciate that. So, um, without any further ado, and, and for um, fear of going too, too long with this one, that was a good introduction to our October, I think. And... Um, for me to you, I appreciate um, all the support and the love that you give me. I'll be getting more uh, videos out to you as soon as I possibly can um, with my buddy D. Hood over here. Uh, we're going to be going out to Lockport this weekend, so hopefully we can put a collaboration together. We will put a collaboration video together. I'm not sure if I'm going to air it on my channel or his, hopefully his, but um, check this video out. It's Collab. He's a musician, too. We put some of his videos up there, but check out the joint venture. Because we're going to be doing that. So also come over and check out my... For more, like um, like I said, in-depth information. You can get more, a little bit more intimate information. Oh, there you go. Not intimate, but... Detailed from my IG, okay? I put specific posts up there. I put pictures up there. Um, for example... Speaking of Savannah, this was a colony of Savannah. What's going on here? They're setting it up or they're digging it out. This is the kind of stuff that I propose there. So come and engage with me over there. You could leave um, messages and whatever, DM me. Gravy. Um, I'm always checking it out. So come check me out. Again, this is uh, Dustin Berserker Bear. You just watched another episode of Bushwhack and History in Buffalo. And... Uh, I'll catch you on the next one. Be safe out there. Keep your heads and your faith up. Watch your six. And as always, I'll report back. All right.